Good morning, Solid Word, and Happy New Year uh, to all of you. I praise God that we've been able to go into a new year, and I definitely thank God for his uh, strong hand and healing power. Um, in my life, thank you for all of you that have prayed for me, um, that have prayed that I recover, and I have. I'm doing well with just one addition. Uh, but thank you again, and I look forward to when we are um, back in person. Um, hopefully, we're looking forward to doing that on January 9th, but we will continue to assess and look at um, the situation, our environment, because we certainly have um, your safety and um, the health of Solid Word in mind. And so stay tuned. We will have more of that coming. This year, I really wanted to help us to get into the frame of mind of seeing what true discipleship is. And we're going to be spending some time in that um, in this year, among other things that the Lord is leading um, for us to um, preach on from God's word. But this morning, as we have this first message in the in, in the in the new year, I'm not trying to be heavy, yet I want to help to focus and point our attention um, toward the heart of true discipleship and to begin that journey for us to really think about what it means to be a true disciple. Um, and with all the resolutions and changes that we're looking to make, I want to make sure that one of those critical foundational things in your life is, am I a true disciple of Christ if indeed I call myself a follower of Christ, a Christian? If you are not or are, or, or, or are unsure if you are a believer, we can surely lead you into that which will completely change your life and will help to set you on a journey for all eternity and one that you can start enjoying now. A life filled with passion and purpose for those of you who are believers to continually ask yourself that question, am I living as a true disciple? Do I understand and live out what it means? To be a true disciple is the heart of true discipleship represented in my life. So for this morning's uh, message, I'm going to ask a question. Will you save your life or lose it this year? Will the decisions that you make, will the actions that you take, will the will the foundation that you launch from, will the things that you set your life on, lead you on a course to saving your own life or losing your life? Now, you might think you know the answer, but after we finish today, I want to ask that question again. We're going to be going from Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 21 because of the context through verse 27, but really spending time more in verses 24 through 27. And so today, as we begin to look at this, I want us just to be thinking about this time. And I want to read what I had written. The new year usually brings new resolutions and choices as we seek to change from the past year. Will your decisions be founded on the heart of true discipleship? Will you seek to save your life or lose it this year? Turn with me again, Matthew 16, and then let's read it. <clears throat> it reads as such, from this time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, 
but on the things of man. Verse 24, where we'll spend a lot of our time. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. This is a very familiar text, and I hope you don't let the familiarity of it really tune you out or cause you to tune out from what the Lord wants to show you and show us this morning. Jesus is intentionally describing to his disciples the way or the road or the journey he must take to be killed, crucified, and resurrected to complete God's mission for him. After being rebuked by Peter and subsequently rebuking Peter himself, Jesus corrects the view that the disciples have of true discipleship. See, still at this point, the disciples did not believe or think about a suffering Messiah. As a matter of fact, I think there are many people today that are claiming Christianity that don't believe or have not been taught that suffering is a part of their discipleship journey, that it is critical, that it was at the center of, of Jesus fulfilling the mission that God had set for him. As a matter of fact, it was that that tripped up his disciples. It was that that caused them not to believe in what they were hearing and seeing. As a matter of fact, I find it interesting as we get into Peter's rebuke of him, somehow Peter missed the resurrection part of that and only focused in on Jesus being killed part of his comment. Because they were both said in the same sentence. He said, I must go to Jerusalem and I will be killed because of the group, <clears throat> the religious leadership, those that should have been leading people to God were going to be responsible for killing God's gift to them. <clears throat> and so we see that he says that the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders were all going to be in concert together and that they were going to kill him and that he would resurrect, said it there, after three days. He says, on the third day, I will resurrect. Somehow all Peter heard was, I'm going to be killed. And in that moment, Peter, who thought he was doing something good, was operating from a vantage point of Satan. Oh, it wasn't saying that Peter was possessed by Satan. It's not what's here. And we know that he had just finished giving that statement that Jesus himself said that the spirit of God is the one who revealed it to you. So in one moment, he was operating by the spirit of God. And in the next moment, he is operating under the influence of the enemy because he was thinking in a human way versus a godly way. As a matter of fact, Jesus says that to him. And he says to him, get behind me or get away from me, Satan. If you notice, that is the same thing he said to Satan himself when he was being tempted back in chapter four after coming off of his fast and that Satan tried to tempt him or to trap him or to get him to do things off of God's course and, and from a human perspective. That should give us a little bit of insight to the heart of true discipleship. 
It will not be by your human ingenuity. It will not be by your human standard. It will not be abiding by what generally humans abide by that will lead you to the heart of true discipleship. It is going to be living by God's will and living on purpose from the Lord. And so with that, <clears throat> Jesus has to turn to the rest of the group because remember, Peter pulled him to the side, called him Lord, so he saw him as Lord, but thought he needed to correct them in that you dying will never happen. That is not what a Messiah does. As a matter of fact, that can't be in God's plan. But we know it was in the center of God's plan and is at the heart of true discipleship. And so we start in verse four. After Jesus, I mean, verse 24, excuse me, after Jesus tells Peter, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man, which is one of the big stumbling blocks for us to live as true disciples when we set our things on what humanity desires and wants versus those things that God has revealed to us through scripture. And I want to show you today just three points I want to focus on as we read from this text about saving or losing our life, the heart of true discipleship. First point is true discipleship is following Jesus according to his definition. So Jesus now turns to the rest of the group, brings Peter back. He's probably reeling because Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. But he was looking at Peter and Peter had just finished hearing him say, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you when you called me the Christ, the Messiah. And I'm wondering what he's thinking, like what on earth? That just happened. Jesus brings him back and turns to the group and says, verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He gives three components to what it will mean to be a true disciple. That first one, we want to look at when he says his definition, his first one is to deny yourself. That goes against everything that this world is about. As a matter of fact, what you will hear said more often is not so much denying yourself as it is indulging yourself. And the only time it's talked about denying yourself is when it will benefit you primarily or those that you're close to, that 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 you will gain some benefit from they from them benefiting. In other words, it is still always about you. But what Jesus says here is, if you desire, he says, then he says, if anyone would come after me, or what it really says, if you desire to follow me. If you have an intention of being a disciple of mine, the first thing that you will have to do is to deny yourself. What does that mean, deny myself? Does that mean this sense of, 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 of self-degrading, that I don't love myself, I don't care for myself, I don't care about myself? It's not what it's saying. When he says that, it is the issue of priority. In other words, he says, you are no longer the top priority in your own life. And that does not come natural for us as humans, even after you've come to Christ. It is a process in which you will have to be intentional about. So when he says, deny yourself, he says, your will is not a priority or your self-preservation is not a priority. In essence, you want to ask yourself some questions. It says, since your will is not a priority, denying yourself will govern how you earn, 
how you spend and how you give money. See, if, if, if you are not wanting to follow Jesus, you can do whatever you want, as you want, when you want, because you made it, you go and spend it however you choose. Give, I only give to those things which make me feel good giving towards, almost to pay it forward. Now, granted, giving to others is good, but many times, especially in the selfie generation that we have here, I want people to see me giving and doing good. Why? Because it makes me look good or it makes me feel good. But when I'm denying myself, my goal is not to lift me up. My goal is to be in line with who Jesus is. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what he did. He denied himself when he came here. The scriptures bear witness to that. So how you earn, spend, and give money, how you entertain yourself will be governed by that. It doesn't mean that you don't entertain yourself, that you live this drab life, that there's no fun in your life at all, but it is always governed by how God calls for us to live in this world that is set against him. How do, what governs how I entertain myself? Another one, how I make decisions just on a daily basis. <clears throat> I've heard it once said, <clears throat> and I agree with it some, that sometimes Christian lives some Christians live at times as functional atheists. What do we mean by that? They live as if God really doesn't exist in matter or that they don't believe he does. They call on his name. They may come to some services and, and, may, and may talk about they want to be blessed by the Lord and the blessings of the Lord. But ultimately, when you look at their decisions in their life, God is nowhere to be found. The grid of scripture is not looked at. They don't make decisions through it. It is really based on their comfort, their benefit, and how it's going to promote them and move them forward. How do you make decisions in your life? Another one is how do you raise your family? You know, is it based on helping them to make sure that they just get ahead in this world? Or, or, or is it based on, I want to teach you how to honor God with your life and that you see it in me all the time. You've heard me say it. I <clears throat> asked my mother years ago, of, of course, when she was like, ask her years ago when I was still living in New York, what does she desire of us? And I remember her answer. And at the time, it didn't really resonate with me until later, as I grew in my faith and I understood it, her answer was, it really didn't matter what you did. She did say, I want you to be able to support yourself that you're not living off of me and your father. Understand that for sure. She says, and, and, and I wanted to be sure that you didn't have the law coming behind you, that you were living, looking over your shoulder. Understand that as well. She wanted me to live legally and healthy. But she said, ultimately, I wanted you to live for Jesus and that your life is rooted in him. And I remember my response, which was really immature. I remember saying, that's it? That's it? You didn't have anything else? And she said, no, I really didn't. Years later, as I grew in my faith, I understood what she meant clearly. That, yeah, that is it. That was it. And I understood that she said that if, if, <clears throat> if the Lord had your heart, it didn't matter what you did. You were going to do it to his glory. It was going to count for eternity. And it was going to bless and benefit others in the process. And so I understood what she meant. Another one in deciding, denying yourself is to ask yourself, how are you living your life in general? Does it look like the pattern of living that Jesus put before us as you read scripture? I'm not talking about living in the first century world. No, I'm not talking about first century dress, first century ways of entertaining. I'm talking about the, the, the character, the way he lived, the choices and why he made them. He was, always about, he was always about his father's will. 
Does that reflect the way you live and make choices? Is that embedded in your resolutions that you've made? See, <clears throat> denying yourself is your will is not a priority, but it also means you live out your desires according to God's standard. And we just looked at that. But then thirdly, you do what's right regardless of the cost to you. That's the counting the cost part of discipleship that we have read in scripture, that we count, that we understand, that we recognize, that we put before us the cost because it's going to cost us. We are not going to always be able to do things that will be comfortable because that may not be the right thing to do. You may want to say something in response to a situation that you're in, and it is not the godly nor right thing to say, but boy, it causes you pain by not saying it. Maybe you do something that brings you pain, even though it's the right thing. I think of the story of Joseph, that each time he kept doing what was right, it seemed to get worse. And for some of you, that may be what's happening. You seem to do and to believe and think what's right, and it doesn't seem to be right in return. Actually, it is right. Because as long as you are living life and making decisions and doing things according to what we are hearing and learning and the principles in scripture, it's right regardless of whether it hurts you, whether it's uncomfortable to you, whether it causes you to be ostracized or accepted, whether it causes you to lose money or gain money, whether it causes you friends, it costs you or you gain some, whether it even causes you income and money because now it starts to affect your livelihood. Some people will jettison the, the, the things of God if it begins to cost them financially. Nah, God, I didn't sign up for this. But discipleship, denying yourself, is doing what's right, regardless of the cost to you. Now, I'm not saying that that's easy. And I am saying that it's a lifelong process. But I'm also saying that you need to start somewhere. And asking yourself, as you move to make decisions in 2022, is this the right thing to do according to the standard of God as given in scripture? Now, if God's not speaking directly to a particular area, he will give you a principle to go by because I believe the scriptures give us everything we need for making decisions in our life. <clears throat> and as we put that there, then we'll begin to see Denying ourselves means depriving myself of that which would make life easier for the sake of living according to God's will. That's at the heart of true discipleship. So not only is it denying yourself, he says to take up your cross. And that goes to uh, what is God calling you to die towards? See, denying yourself is one thing. I may deny that and I may only have to deny myself that for just a little bit of time. But if I'm dying towards something, I am, I, I am considering myself dead. I don't respond to it. Maybe sometimes it's you wanting vindication or wanting to be known to be right. It's not just denying yourself. I may die towards that. Lord, they may call me crazy, wrong, stupid, or whatever you want to use. But if you've taken up your cross, you're saying, I am dying toward having to vindicate myself for the sake of living for Jesus. Now, he may give you an opportunity to vindicate it yourself, but it may not be for the sake of just vindicating yourself. It may be for the sake of demonstrating and displaying the character and the life of Christ in you. Because this is for the glory of God, not for the comfort of Curtis. 
Another thing that you may want to die towards, you may have to die towards, is making yourself comfortable over your character growing. See, sometimes God will cause things to happen in your life and that you just have to die towards the alternative because it doesn't develop character in you. Man, maybe that is that promotion. How dare I say that? Doesn't God want me to prosper and to make more money? Not if it causes your Christian character to take a hit. Doesn't God want me to, and you fill in the blank, not if it causes you to turn away from him or to walk away from him. Now, can I do something and still walk in him? You sure can. But it may cause you more struggle. It may cause you more money. It may cause you more time. Because what you are doing is not necessarily just fulfilling something to be comfortable. You are allowing God to be seen through you and your character on a regular basis. That will take sacrifice. And sometimes people won't recognize it as a sacrifice. Sometimes they won't even recognize your sacrifice. Sometimes they may even try to manipulate and abuse you. And what if you are manipulated for the sake of Christ? We'll look at that later. He says here that you are to take up your cross. You are to willingly put yourself in a position to die towards something. That's what the cross was for. There was an expectation that you were dead towards it. It may even be dead towards the sins that you've been giving room for in your life. You've been comfortably excusing yourself with the sins that you constantly trip over. Well, God understands my heart. Well, the Lord knows I'm human. Well, God knows this is my struggle. Translated, I really don't wanna let go of this, but if I call it a struggle, I might be able to hang on for just a little longer as opposed to killing it in your life. Killing the way you talk to people. Killing the attitudes that you tend to have that are not Christ-like. Killing the choices and decisions you make that lead you away from the Lord and may put you on the outs with some people that you wanted to kind of hang out with. And so I have here also that you're wanting to vindicate maybe something you, you, you died towards making yourself comfortable versus character development. Another one is dying to those things that drive your choices. Maybe it's just safety. And you say, what's wrong with safety? Nothing if it doesn't drive you away from Jesus Christ. He's not saying that you go out looking for harm and looking for a death wish, but if you doing the godly thing in this situation puts you in a position that may not be the safest, is it what God wants? Does God ultimately want safety for you? Or does he ultimately want godly character displayed in this sinful world that leads others to Christ and grows you up in the faith? See, I think sometimes that we've bought a westernized version of Christianity that has us seeking for comfort more than anything else and calling it being Christ-like. Yet when we look at the life of Christ, comfort was not the first thing that he focused on. You say, yeah, but he was Jesus. He had to die for our sins. Yeah, but he just told you, if you're going to come after me, here's what's going to have to happen. If you're going to follow my pattern, you're going to have to deny yourself because that's the only way you're going to take up your cross if you deny yourself. Because if I'm trying to look out for myself, there's no way under the sun I'm taking up a cross. And so it's a progression. You're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to take up your cross and then you're going to have to follow him or follow his pattern. So what he is actually saying is following him, following him 
requires, in other words, living by his pattern, walking in the way he walked requires self-denial and dying. And those are two qualities that in our Western, especially American culture, that are not high up. And we're going to have to learn and understand we may find ourselves opposed to American culture as we live for Jesus Christ. And we'll have some people thinking that we are out of our minds because we're making choices that mirror the character of Christ instead of the comfort of the masses. And so that last part is, follow him. I had deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. Let me ask you these questions when we talk about following him. Who has your ear? Who are you listening to? And all the time we say, I'm listening to God. But when you really honestly reflect on who motivates you and how they motivate you or what motivates you, is it, is it founded? Is it, is it resting in the character of Jesus Christ as recorded in scripture? Or is it some mix of the world and culture and, and, and whatever else is mixed in there and you realize it's not purely Christ? Who has your ear? What or who has your heart? What are you passionate about? What gets you going? Man, what do you start to pursue? And even if you pursue things in this world, <clears throat> what is the basis for the pursuit? And it may be something that you desire and you like, but are you willing to do anything for it? Are you willing to go against what you know God says to obtain it, to get it? to acquire it, some people will go at any cost to get what they desire, even if it leads them away from Jesus. What destination drives your movement? In other words, what destiny, what destination are you, uh, motivates you to move? What is it that you hope to see and end with? And yes, you can do, I want to be a better, and you put in student, I want to be a better dad, I want to be a better athlete, I want to be a better employee, business owner, you fill in the blanks, and those are good, those are not bad, but what's the ultimate end? Do you want to be a better business person so that you reflect the character of Jesus in all aspects and people can see the excellence in your business pointing towards your excellence in living for Jesus? Or are you known for cutting corners so you can make a dollar? Athlete. I'm going to be an athlete at all costs and I will, I, will, I will manipulate the system and I will do that which I know is against the character of Christ so that I become that athlete because I'm, I'm just seeking to be great. Are you seeking to be great or are you seeking to be Christ-like? in everything you do. And that's going to bring some greatness there. But it's just not being great that I'm looking at. Student, mom, dad, you fill in the blank. Is that what's driving you? Because if what's driving you is only those temporary things, how do you have an eternal focus about you? So true discipleship is following Jesus according to his definition. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. But true discipleship is actually losing your life. He says, because he explains it in verse 25, for whoever would save his life will lose it. In other words, if you are about living your best life now as by your definition and not God's, he said, ultimately, you may enjoy this whole life and attain a whole lot. You may get everything you want, but you would have lost in the end. Why? Because saving, trying to save your own life, meaning trying to live life for this life only without eternity in mind 
is losing because you will not seek eternal life. You will not seek Christ. You surely won't seek to follow him. But then he says, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You're looking for true purpose in life? Jesus says, lose it for me. In, in other words, take your priorities and put them to the side and take my priorities. I will still give you desires. You will still be someone here on this earth doing things on this earth. God's not telling you to escape the reality of, I mean, that you're living in that you don't work, that you don't go to school, that you don't do sports. That he's not saying that. What he is saying is that is not your top priority. And so he says to you and I, as he turns to all the disciples, whoever loses his life. So true discipleship is losing your life, losing your life in a world that says live your best life now. True disciple is losing your true discipleship is losing your life in a world that says seek your own comfort. First, priority. True discipleship is losing your life in a world that says put everything and everyone else second all the time. You are first all the time. True discipleship is losing your life in a world that says live by your own beliefs doing you regardless of the consequences. And once again, once again, is that what the scriptures say? Is that the pattern of life that we see in Christ? See, it's subtle and it's a slick way of luring you away. True discipleship is losing your life because Jesus asked this question, and he, and, and he intends for you to think it through and answer it. Verse 26 says, for what will it profit a man? Because he says that you're talking about gaining and profit and benefits. What, is it, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his own soul? He's now talking about eternity. I've heard it said once this way. He says, what if all of the world's resources were under your control? He's a, he's not just chop, he he's not just talking about you know Bezos or 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 you think of any of the top people in the world, owner of Amazon. Okay, that's one. Owner of 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 of, of Tesla and all the science. That's another. You know, owner of of Google. Owner of you put in all of these titans of business. We have Zuckerberg and we have some of the other ones out there. These are separate people. What if you had all of it under your control? Jesus is saying, what does it profit a man if he gains all of that, everything, this whole world, whatever this world has to offer you, if you gain all of that, what benefit is it to you if you get that? 70 years, 80 years, 100 years. And at the end of that, you lose your soul for all eternity. That sets a perspective for us because none of us will get all the world. We may get part of it and some will get a big chunk of it. But he says, even if you gain all of it, it's not going to be of any real profit to you because in the end, you've lived for yourself and you lose. So he is setting our perspective that living just for yourself is not what God intends and is not the pattern that we've seen in Jesus and that he's calling for us as true disciples. And because he says, or what shall a man give in return for his soul? What would you give in exchange for it? What he's actually saying is what is actually worth your eternal soul. But that's what's at stake when we live for ourselves, purely for ourselves, without considering living for Jesus. But also, and lastly, true discipleship is really finding your life. Why? 
because you live according to his will here. He gives you not only comfort, he is, he is covering your life. He is giving you purpose. You have a passion for living and for the things that you do in this life. Not only how you lead others to faith and you help them to grow, but even in the things that you put your hands to do, God calls for us to work. So as you excel as a student, and that's great, you know that I have that reward here and another later. As you excel as a businessman or woman, you have that here doing it God's way, and you excel later as well. You benefit later. Your career, your you filling in, your parenting, you know, how you earn and make money, all of that. You can benefit here. Oh, you may not make as much. You may, you may not. There's nothing that says because you're a Christian, I'm going to make the most I can ever make. Sometimes the decisions you have to make may actually cost you money. And guess what? It's okay because you're still in God's grip. You're still in God's hands. And what he actually says is, listen, true discipleship is really finding your life. Why? Because he says, verse 27, for the son of man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father. I'm going to stop here. That is a fact. That's not to be debated. Jesus said it himself. I am coming back. He called himself the son of man. That is, that is the son of God who took on flesh and became a man. He says, I am returning with angels my angels, which speaks of authority, which speaks of rule and reign, which speaks of power. And he says, for the son of man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father, in the weightiness, in the heaviness of who God is as father. Jesus is returning and here's what he will do. In his, in his promise to come back, he says that will happen Here's some things that he says. He says, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. God says, look, this is not in vain. Your sacrifice isn't in vain. What you've given up for me isn't in vain. As a matter of fact, it won't be compared. And I'll share that in just a moment. But what he says is he will give rewards based on how you've lived and what you've done. That should set our resolutions for this year alone. He will give rewards based on the priorities that you've set in your life. And again, he's not saying that you don't do these things, but they're done with him as the priority. And so what we see here is he is saying it's worth it to be a true disciple. Because when I come, I'm handing out the rewards and there isn't anything here that can compare to those rewards. As a matter of fact, he says it when he says, what will you give in exchange for yourself? There's nothing here on planet earth that is worth exchanging your soul over, but he says, but the rewards that I'm bringing will be in addition to you finding life and knowing it well. And so for you and I, we have to take that into mind as we set our plans for 2022. We all know that everyone had lofty plans when we were going from 19 into 20 and that changed. And then we were hoping 21 was something different only to be just as crazy, if not worse. And, and I think we've kind of learned our lessons. You know, people are kind of tiptoeing quietly into 2022 saying, Lord, this is all on you. But understand something with that. When I have given myself over to Christ, my priorities are his. I am growing in my character to look more and more like Jesus. As I put my hands to do what God has put in front of me, I can live securely because there are rewards that are coming. The greatest one is eternal life itself and being with Jesus and the Father for all eternity but he is rewarding faithfulness in those who have lived according to his purpose. Eternal life will outshine all the hurt and heartache you will endure 
for the short time that you are here. And I say short because even if you live to be 100, 150, put 150 besides eternity, beside eternity. It's not even a drop in the ocean. Because eternity says after 20 million years, you're just getting started. Now, just as eternity with God is the same, being lost eternally is the same way. After 20 million years, you are just getting started being eternally lost and away from God. That is unfathomable to think about. I can't even imagine that. But what God is calling for us, he says, I've done everything I've needed to do. All you need to do is to choose to live for me. I want to end with Romans 8.18. It's a verse that we're familiar with. Romans 8.18. And it says here, Paul is talking, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And understand that. He said, it can't even be compared. It can't be in the same plane, the same room, the same conversation. What you are going through in this present time hurts and is considered suffering. And it may be you going, man, I'm missing out on some things that, that, are, that are painful because I'm choosing to live for Jesus. God says, it won't even compare when you put it to the glory that is to be revealed. It will, be, it will be beyond compare. So what he tells us is then, live for me and it'll be worth it. Live for yourself and it won't. So I have some questions for you at the end. By whose priority will you live? By whose priority will you live by? By whose priority will you live? If it's yours, I'm going to guarantee you, if, if, if you are the only priority in your life, when you get to the end of it, there will be great disappointment. And, and during it, some disappointment because you can't always make your own way. There are, there are situations and people and places that can overpower and overcome your desires. You, will, you won't get everything you desire. And even in Christ, you may not get everything you quote unquote desire, but you will get everything he desires for you. Secondly, by whose standard will you live? First was by whose priority? By whose standard will you live? If it is God's standard, you can rest assured you are living the way that you were intended to live regardless of what you do in life. And then lastly, don't live just religiously this year. Live passionately for Jesus. Desire him. He says in verse 24, those who will desire to come after me, those who would, those who are intentional. And he is calling us to be intentional. That was not a warning saying, hey, you better make sure you want to do this. No, he is saying, understand this is a part of it, but desire it, want it. Why? Because it is worth it for him. And so as we start in this new year, I want to ask you that question. Will you save your life? Or will you lose it? Because understand, if you lose your life for his sake, Jesus says you will find it. But if all you're doing is seeking to live life your way, saving it, doing your best now for you, Jesus says you'll lose it. And I would say this year, let's look to lose ourselves for him, finding who we are, in the process and loving it every step of the way. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, that we can live for you passionately, losing ourselves in this present time and gaining all of eternity while passionately enjoying this life even as we struggle in this life. Help us not to get sucked into this world's turn of wanting to live for ourselves and by ourselves, but to live for you in a way, oh God, that would cause us to reflect who you are. I pray that we would make those choices that honor you 
and let God display who you are in us. Help us to grow this year as we look at being true disciples and what that means. We ask you this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great Sunday. Have a great week and have a great start to the new year. Solid word. We look forward to seeing you in person as we can get back together. God bless you.